you everyone for coming to our workshop. We're really excited about this turnout to talk to you a little bit about why the African liberation struggle is an anti-colonial, anti-capitalist national liberation struggle and not just an anti-racist struggle. Next slide. We are the All African People's Revolutionary Party. We are representing New Mexico chapter and California chapter. My name is Adrian. Andrew. Hi. John. Um, and we are part of, next slide. I think it's the air. There we go. Sweet. We are part of the All African People's Revolutionary Party, which is an international pan African revolutionary socialist party that was founded in Africa by this gentleman right here, who is Kwame Nkrumah, the first democratically elected president of the first country in Africa to gain independence from colonialism, Ghana. Um, we believe that when Africa is free, people of African descent anywhere, everywhere will be free. And so we are seeking to organize African people everywhere, whether in Albuquerque, Detroit, Ghana, Jamaica, around the singular goal of building a unified socialist Africa. <laughs> so um, as African people, we um, always like to, before we do anything, commemorate our ancestors because we believe that we would not be here without their sacrifice. So we do that through a process that we call libation. And what we do is we acknowledge those who came before us and made it so that we could be here today. So today we want to commemorate, today is the 53rd commemoration of the Watts Rebellion. In 1965, um, African people in the city of Los Angeles, California, rose up in righteous indignation against police terrorism. So we want to acknowledge those who lost their lives in that struggle. And the way we do that, you all, is we, um, we pour water. And when we pour it, we say ashe together. And ashe is ki Swahili. It means let it be. So when I pour the water, I want to ask everybody to say ashe. So we pour water in respect for our ancestors, and we say ashe. 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 Thank you. Sweet. Um, so I just want to preface this by saying I'm a little bit anxious to present in front of y'all because this topic is really important, and this conference is really important. When I'm anxious, I tend to swear. So. Heads up, <laughs> or I'm a potty mouth. <laughs> so first we're going to talk about what is colonialism, because we don't want to assume that everybody knows all the terms that we're using, so we want to set a baseline level of understanding, so we're all starting from the same place. So colonialism is, in a nutshell, a parasitic relationship between two countries. One country sees another that has land, resources, labor to exploit, and they're like, that looks pretty sweet, we're going to take a shit. And so they go into um, the country that, they, that has the resources they want, and they enact this process of violence and extraction that leaves the colonized country underdeveloped, and which leaves the colonizing country developed. And this is kind of captured in a nutshell in this picture. You can kind of see on the right-hand side, there's a dark-skinned person in a severely underdeveloped city where we see factories like um, shooting pollution into the sky, we see um, underdeveloped roads, you see starving children, and then on the left-hand side, we see like the representation of Vegas. It looks like Vegas. It's clearly the West. Um, there's white-skinned folks driving convertibles, all kinds of like opulence, all kinds of like development, throwing a burger across to the poor side. And basically what this is trying to show is that everything that exists in terms of infrastructure, in terms of technological advancement, in terms of, uh, I don't know, things that we consider first world, can only exist with the exploitation of Africa and the global South. Everything Europe is, everything the United States is, everything Australia, Israel is, came directly from extraction from the third world. So everything these countries have that make them modern came because they stole from Africa and the global south. Next slide. So this is like, probably like the first question you have is like, how is that possible? How is it that a country can go into another one, um, take their shit, and have that continue for centuries? It's a multi-pronged process of violence, of extraction, and of systematic oppression. So obviously, like the first point of contact is usually incredibly violent. We know that history here in New Mexico is the same in Africa. Europeans came with like uh, gunpowder and guns um, and steel weapons that were that indigenous people did not have, and used that technology to steal our shit through outright violence. Um, and so that theft looks like stealing land, stealing resources, and in the case of African people, stealing people. So there's this like this kind of like. Marx calls it primitive accumulation, in which the imperialist colonizing powers went into the global south, went into Africa, and literally just like sucked out everything valuable and took it back to Europe. And at the same time, there was a parallel process of extreme and systematic and intentional underdevelopment in the colonized countries. And so part of that process of extraction and violence and theft 
also includes the destruction or the attempted destruction of the indigenous culture. And the reason they try to do that is because culture for colonized people, and really for people anywhere, is a weapon. It's like our identity, it's like the things that we value, it's our connection to the land, the connection to each other. And so you can see very clearly, when you look at how these things all work together, how it is a basis for resistance, how we can use it to figure out how to fight back. And so the first step, always in like a colonizing process, is to attempt to destroy or manipulate that culture. That's why we see, for example, like um, indigenous cultures all over the world had like many different conceptions of gender, many different conceptions of like um, identity and like who and uh, spirituality that were systematically criminalized and erased by the colonizing powers. And this is an intentional process to divide and subjugate the colonized people, destroy who we are, so we do not have a basis to fight back. So. The, that is like the, the tactics they use, and the end result is the total political and legal domination of the colonized people. It is that systematic, oh, excuse me, that systematic underdevelopment that I mentioned, in which they don't allow us to like build schools. If they build roads, it's like only to the ocean to take our stuff. Um, if they build railroads, like again, only for extraction. It's like all of these systems, um, all the systems that would advance the people, are intentionally downpressed and not allowed to develop. And all the systems that uh, facilitate that extraction are overdeveloped. And then the end result of that is a dominant and a dominant subordinate relationship between the colonizing power and the colonized power that is self-perpetuating. Next slide. And we say it's self-perpetuating because in order to sort of like rationalize and justify the subjugation and the theft and the murder, they create like all these lies about us and like a a parallel set of lies about them that sort of like makes sense within the warped internal logic of the colonial system. So they say that we're lazy, they say we're violent, and these are things that we hear about indigenous people, African people, all colonized people. We're lazy, we're violent, we're savage, we're stupid, like we are, our countries are a mess just because we can't get it together, there's something about who we are, but that's not the case. As we just discussed, we were underdeveloped, our resources were stolen to build up the West, so it's not something about us. Is what that process has done to us. But what colonialism and imperialism and capitalism do is make this, make these like lies about us part of the new identity that's built for us. And that is how racism works. And that's how white supremacy works. Racism spreads the lie that we are inferior, white supremacy spreads the lie that they are superior, and those are the tactics that are used to justify the ongoing process of colonialism and imperialism. So yeah. So yeah, these are just like a bunch of Oh, and the other interesting thing, for example, is that these lies will switch depending on the needs of the colonial system. So during chattel slavery of Africans, they said, oh, they're docile, they're submissive, they like it, they need it. But then as soon as um, chattel slavery was over, um, through the actions of our ancestors who fought back and saved themselves, then after that, they were like, no, they're too dangerous, they need to be put down, they need to be controlled. Like, they switch it up depending on the needs of capitalism and colonialism. Next slide. So this is a quote from Amical Cabral, who is the, one of the leaders of the PAIGC, and Guinea-Bissau, who led that nation to independence from Portuguese colonialism. And in this quote, he says, in combating racism, we do not make progress if we combat the people themselves. We have to combat the causes of racism. If a bandit comes to my house and I have a gun, I cannot shoot the shadow of the bandit. I have to shoot the bandit. Many people lose energy and effort and make sacrifices combating shadows. We have to combat the materiality that reduces the shadow. So this is the essential difference between an anti-racist struggle and an anti-colonial struggle. Anti-racist struggle, you are trying to change the hearts and minds of settlers. You are trying to appeal to settler colonial capitalist power structures to show you mercy, to make incremental progress. Anti-colonial um, struggle recognizes that these are all like the racist ass white people are symptoms of a problem. They are not the problem themselves. The problem is the colonial capitalist structure. We do not want to change the hearts and minds of racists, we want to remove the power for them to act on those racist ass feelings. That is the difference between anti-racism and anti-colonialism. And there's like a long history of colonized people all over Africa and all over the world engaging in national liberation struggles, anti-colonial struggles. And I'm going to pass it to Andrew to talk about some of the ideology behind that. Yeah, thank you. And I'll stick to your slide. Okay, so thank you for that setup, Adrian. Wow, okay. I'm not as charismatic, so thank you for staying away for the next 12 to 15 minutes. Um, okay, so what is Pan-Africanism? Um, I know most of y'all probably heard that word somewhere. 
not really sure exactly what, what it is. That's what this section is about. So first, a little background. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So there are 2 billion Africans across the world. I know Adrian in her section said that word Africans a bunch of times. Um, and to an American audience, that usually means people from the continent, Africa. Uh, when we say African, we were talking about all African people worldwide, of which there are about twice as many or just as many living outside of the continent as on it. Um, and our definition and understanding of African as Africans is going to be a little bit more broad than what you're used to. So you'll see on here that there's 300 million Africans in India. Um, people, even if your immediate ancestors were not born on the continent of Africa, um, you know, you can be African because our definition of African is more of a cultural definition, and it's based on do you experience the conditions and the impression of being an African person? So some people will say, well, wait, isn't everybody from Africa? They're like, yeah, human beings are from Africa, so technically everybody's from Africa. But a lot of y'all don't experience the negative aspects of being African in your day-to-day -day lives or at all ever. So you probably would not consider yourself African and would not be considered African, right? Uh, another good counterexample that people bring up is like, well, what about Elon Musk is African and he's white? And <laughs> I heard some size. Thank you, y'all. <laughs> um, maybe if Elon Musk had ever experienced the, neg the negative effects of being an African person, he could uh, claim that with some sincerity, but obviously he hasn't. People like him. I'm not, uh, so we generally wouldn't consider them African, although maybe someday their their descendants will decide to side with the <laughs> right side of history. <laughs> but we'll see. Uh, that's their that's their struggle. Um, so yeah, that's there are two billion Africans worldwide and on the continent, and also what we call the African diaspora all over the planet. Next slide, please. Uh, and so, moving a little bit towards our definition of Pan Africanism. There are 54 countries in Africa, so a lot of political entities, and there are significant numbers of African people in most of the world's countries. Uh, so when we talk about the effects of Pan-Africanism, Pan-Africanism affects all of those people in all of those places and their relationships with all of those governments. Um, and here's where we get to a really important part of Pan-Africanism, is that the destinies, the futures, and the day-to-day -day lives of African peoples in every country in the world is largely dictated uh, by the mostly onerous actions um, and odious actions of non-African peoples. So uh, Nigeria has a lot of negative influence from the international, mostly European uh, oil and gas industry. Um, African Americans live under a very severe police state, um, or new Africans as we call ourselves. But guys who are part African-American, um, Aboriginal Australians who often consider themselves African and we consider African uh, because of the shared struggle um, are similarly under a colonial police state. Uh, so, you know, right now African peoples around the world and the diaspora um, share a lack of control over our own destiny. Next slide, please. And that's where Pan-Africanism comes in. So the idea that African peoples have a shared history and a shared future that's brighter because we're sharing it together probably rose in a lot of places, but more recently and more formally uh, in the version that really kind of caught like wildfire and spread throughout the world uh, was founded by philosopher Marcus Garvey, who is an African from Jamaica, uh, born in the end of the 19th century. Um, it was active in the United States and around the West and on the continent as well. Um, and he basically said uh, Africans we have a past that we share together that brings us together as one people, um, but that if we are united in our, you know, looking towards the future, um, that is going to benefit Africans everywhere. And that specifically, uh, if there is a Af united African continent, uh, that that is good for Africans everywhere too. Uh, next slide, please. So the fundamental basis for Pan-Africanism um, is one, an effort to, distor, to restore dignity to African people. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the ability to shape your own future um, and to set your own identity. Uh, so I know the African people in the room will be able to relate to, have you ever referred to yourself 
as African American and been told by a non African person, no, you're black, mm -hmm. or called yourself black and been told by a non African person, no, you're African American, mm -hmm. or called yourself, you know, African, Afro Cuban or African and be like, no, you're just Cuban, or whatever version of your identity that you thought you had, uh, but a non African person felt the need to correct you. Uh, and I think you can all understand that that really doesn't make sense. Um, and that's definitely not a, we don't want to live that way. So Pan-Africanism um, gives us the right to control our own identities, our own destiny, and our own dignity. And another important part of Pan-Africanism is the ability to control our own resources, including our labor, our land, our vast mineral wealth that all of our cell phones and the global economy runs off of. Um, and that when both of those things, control of our own resources and control of our, and our own, you know, maintenance of our own dignity um, exists, that it gives a basis uh, for African people to perceive ourselves and the way that we want to perceive ourselves and to have control of our own perceptions too. Uh, next slide, please. So Pan-Africanism, part of the dream of Pan-Africanism is a shared destiny in which there is one, uh, nation political infrastructure on the African continent. Um, and then so we have to talk about nationalism. So nationalism has two modes. One is going from a larger national infrastructure and doing what we call balkanization, where the nation is split down and asunder into multiple generally warring identities. Uh, and the, a good example is Yugoslavia. If any of you all remember the 90s, that was a it took a, a decade of just war, death, and multiple genocides. Uh, and they ended up in a much less disadvantageous place. Um, and the good example of nationalism, next slide please, is what is going to happen in Africa, where you have 54 countries uh, that were created by a really messed up, sliced up colonial map, um, united into one country. And when that happens, you know, you get all of the good from everyone and all of the bad gets to be debated. Um, and there's, you can't have war between nations if there's only one of them, right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is good nationalism. And uh, let me see another good example is they tried to do this in Europe over the last 30 years, but it, it recently started to totally fall apart. <laughs> so Europe has a habit of doing that, I guess. Next slide, please. Um, so Pan-Africanism, when there is one united African nation, uh, it's gonna be good for Africans everywhere. I think, like I said earlier, um, the African diaspora is large, and it includes a lot more people than you're used to considering. Um, and when there is a united Africa, uh, that nation and those people will be able to advocate for Africans elsewhere in the world. So what does it mean to advocate, and why is that necessarily going to happen? Well, you know, if you are a Chinese tourist in Albuquerque, and you get hit by... I don't know, the art bus or something, <laughs> the Chinese consulate is going to get on the phone with Tim Keller and chew him out until there's some repercussions for it. You know, um, I think there was an Australian colonial woman who was shot in Minnesota, um, and the Australian government got on the phone and made sure something happened about it. Um, similarly, when there is a United Africa, uh, you know, new Africans in Oakland, if you, you're, if you have a, a relative who was murdered in the street, you don't have to wait for the uh, United States government to care. You can uh, ask the you know, continental African government to advocate on your behalf. Um, and so I think now it's going to be Ajama. go over to Ajama to explain why Pan-Africanism must be socialist. So, so we define Pan-Africanism as one unified socialist act. And so the question is, um, why are we saying our Pan-Africanism has to be socialist? because we understand socialism is a bad word in America. So we are unashamingly socialist, because a lot of people talk about anti-capitalism today, and this is a wonderful thing. But the challenge we have for you is, the question is, who is going to own and control the means of production? And what we argue is that there's only two ways to answer that question. Either some people are going to own it, or everybody's going to own it. And so we have to grapple with that. So we are socialists. So the dominant economic system in the world today is capitalism. Anybody here disagree with that? Okay, so what is capitalism? That's a question for you all. What is it? What's the definition of capitalism? Profit for a few. Say again? Profit for a few. Thank you. So 
for that's perfect. So we'll just add on to that for the purpose of this discussion. Capitalism is a system where the means of production on earth are owned and controlled for private profit, right? So we say that we can't build our unity and our contribution to the world based on a backward system like that. It's that system that created through the colonial effort 500 plus years ago, created the infrastructure that has placed Africa and African people in the conditions we're in today. All of you that have cell phones here, they don't work without Columbine Tantalite. And that is a very exploitative mineral ore that our people die for in the Congo to pick every day. This system is based, I, I saw an African the other day, he had on a Brooks Brothers suit. And he's like, I got a Brooks Brothers suit. And I'm like, you ain't the first one to wear those suits because Brooks Brothers suits started wearing clothes for our ancestors on the slave plantation. This entire economy was based on destroying Africa. So we can't build what we want to build on a system like that. So we have to create something different. Next one, please. Thank you. So that's why we say we need a socialist system. And the way we define socialism, again, is where everybody owns the means of production for common benefit. Doesn't mean you don't have to work. You actually, you work harder under a socialist system because you have a different, you have a different set of objectives. But just to give you an example, we're talking about, and Pan-Africanism is not something like, it's not just in our heads. Like our party is active organizing Pan-Africanism on the ground throughout the African world. In fact, Adrian and I, along with some other people here, are going to Ghana in a couple of weeks to participate in a conference we're organizing, our chapter there is organizing. So we just want to make sure you know that. It's not just a dream in our head. It's real. It's happening on the ground. And this book here is our blueprint print for achieving Pan-Africanism. But just to give you an example why we say socialism, we want to have a planned economy where we look at how many people are in our society, how many people need jobs, what are the needs in the society, and how do we organize to meet those needs. That's what socialism does. Capitalism has no planned economy. Like some of you in here, your your housing expenses might be 150 percent of your income. That's not a good plan. How's that working out? It don't work out too well. Some of us in here, we don't know if our lights are on. When we get back to the crib. That's not cool. So that's not a planned economy. We don't want that. We want something where everything is planned, where we can project how we want our society to go. So just to give you a quick example. Today, the largest corporation in Africa is the Dangote Corporation. It was founded by this dude, um, Akil Dangote. It's the largest corporation in Africa. It's the most profitable corporation in Africa. And their stated mission is that they're going to build food sources for everybody on the African continent. Now, I don't know what they're doing. They've been in existence like a decade. But I do know there are 300 million people in Africa today who are starving. And that's half of the population of starving people on the planet Earth. So clearly this model is not working. What we want is a system where we can bring in people's creativity, people's planned uh, participation in a collective process, and we can solve our problems. We can have free education where people get education to learn skills to solve it. All the machinery, this is a, this is a, um, a drill that's drilling for gold in Ghana, in Takarati, Ghana, that when we were there three years ago, we saw so the, the machine, we know the machinery is there right now. And we can create through socialist education, the education process to learn how to use it, to create a system where we can use the resources for the masses of our people. So since we're revolutionaries, we're not talking about going to this evergreen mining company from Australia and saying, can we use your machine? We're talking about seizing the machinery and using it for the people's struggle. We just want to make sure that's clear. We're talking about taking back what was stolen from us. That's what we're going to do. So that's what we're organizing to do. And then the last thing is we talk about socialism. Um, Andrew um, laid out a beautiful uh, framework for Pan-Africanism. Adrian laid out a beautiful framework for colonialism. So just to give you all a quick example. So when we say we want socialism and we want it to be a system uh, for Pan-Africanism because it gives us respect as a people. Just to give you an example, like I get the opportunity, I speak to a lot of African youth. And every time when I do it, the people who invite me to do it, they get mad afterwards because they want you to tell our youth, well, pull your pants up. And I don't tell our youth that. And it's not because I want to see people's booties. That's not, that's not the thing. The reason why I don't tell them that is because I know that's not the issue. The issue is that we're not respected as a people. And I, what I tell the youth is that if you're going to dress like that, you need to have a plan. Because I know that if, if they control oil, 
all of y'all will be sagging your pants. You can get a good price on the way. That's really what the issue is. They have nothing to do with because it's just some European somewhere said a suit and tie is appropriate dress. That's just somebody's subjective opinion. It's a, I don't even like dressing like that. This, this to me is appropriate attire. So that's just subjective. So it's, it can't be that. It's a question of power. And so colonialism stripped that from us. And we say that by creating a united socialist Africa, that's how we bring that back. Okay. So now I'm going to ask my comrade, Sister Adrienne, to come back up and talk about African indigenous solidarity. So we are presenting at the Native Liberation Conference. We are an African organization. You might be like, why? Why are you doing that? Um, and that is because we are not here out of charity. We are not here because we have a savior complex. We are here because we understand that indigenous people in this hemisphere are fighting the same enemy that we are fighting in Africa on a different front. Irish people in Ireland are fighting the same enemy there that we are fighting in Africa on a different front. Same thing with Palestinians, same thing with Filipino people, same thing with colonists people all over the world. There's the same struggle on many different fronts, which means if indigenous people win here, it advances our struggle in Africa. If Palestinians win there, it advances our struggle in Africa. And if we win, it advances struggles everywhere. Yeah. So that is why we're here, because we have to understand that we have to build solidarity across colonized struggles all over the world in order to defeat the system once and for all. And also, on this land in the Western Hemisphere, there's a long, like, 500-year history of African and indigenous side-by-side um, -side struggle. Like, when our ancestors left plantations and, and had uprisings, they would often form independent maroon colonies alongside indigenous settlements. So, like, there's a long history going back of us working together, and we're just saying, that needs to come back. So, and then the other, the other message we want to um, give today is um, the necessity for organization. Organization is crucial. So I'm going to ask you all a question. Be honest. Who in here is in an organization working for justice? Okay. All right. Y'all, you Mexico, y'all do this in California, you asked that question, it's like only two or three people. So, so that's beautiful. If y'all telling the truth, that's good. All right. But um, so we just want to say organization is the key because a lot of people today, like, well, like, I, you know, I don't like organization. Organizations, uh, they, they, you know, they, they suppress my creativity. I can't do that. And my, my, our response to that is, if you believe that and you think you can solve the problem by yourself, I, I don't know what you're waiting for. I wish you could do it. I could go camping. You know, cool. I need a break. So if you know the solution, then please resolve it. But the reason why you're not is because you can't do it by yourself. We can only do it collectively. And so we say join an organization, and we're not saying you have to join. You got to have Robert's Rules of Orders, and you got to meet at this time and end at this time, and people get per. That's 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 not organization. Is two or more people who are engaged in a common objective. Okay. When I was in LA, I was involved with the Crips street organization when I was a very young, confused, young person, that was an organization, y'all, because they told me, you cannot leave. Okay, that's an organization. All right, so don't get caught up in that. Anything that's two or more people engaged in work is an organization, and we got to get people engaged in that. So those of you who are involved in that, that raise your hands, great. Don't just do it so you could get weed and get some people to sleep with you. Do it because you're dedicated. We got y'all in organizations know that needs to be said. Do it, because, do it because it's the right thing to do and because we can build capacity that way. And those of you that didn't raise your hands, appreciate your honesty. You got to get in some organization working for justice. If you don't see one that you like here today that we're going to talk about, then you got to start the, I don't know why these African people are here at this conference talking organization. And you got to do that and make that happen today. So we actually have some questions for y'all. This is the last slide that we're going to do the question practice. Okay. But as a quick preface, um, we are an organization focused on a very particular struggle of colonized people. Um, and we're so happy to be at this conference put on by organizations made up largely of colonized people. So we're asking that the space in the room be uh, first given to colonized people who want to be part of this conversation. So if you're not colonized, just politely step back. You will have your time, like literally any other time. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the first question um, we want to pose to the crowd, and then after that, y'all can ask me to do a little back and forth is, um, for indigenous people specifically, the indigenous thing that's uh, what is now the United States, what is your vision for society on this land after the U.S.? Um, so the U.S. is temporary. It is not forever. Right. It is not even that old. Uh, and history has a way of ending things that are unsustainable inherently anyway. Um, and the empire will fall. 
So what is your vision for life um, on Turtle Island after the United States? You might have any Seven digits people. Over here. Oh, what is your vision, uh, your your vision for society on this land after the United States? Then we had one over here. I see a hand, a tentative. I see you. Hi. <laughs> My vision for society on this land States is actually a lot like society on this land for the United States, <laughs> for imperialism. Um, what I would love to see is a return to indigenous ideologies and value structures all over the world, um, because those were sustainable. Um, and uh, I think that, that pretty much sums it up. Thank you. Any other visions? Hi, Nick. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I, was, I was supposed to moderate this event. I apologize. I was downstairs. But I, I want to um, participate and say that uh, riffing off of um, Emilcar Cabral, you know, he was talking about, you know, the, the shadow that's cast by the material sort of conditions. I would say that we also, you know, what proliferates, you know, in the absence of empire, what proliferates in the shadow of empire is that indigenous peoples aren't, you know, to also riff off um, Cabral again is to say he talks about returning to the source um, and for indigenous peoples um, that's been a common thread of our resistance is the fact that we never you know um, Cabral was talking about okay so we have colonialism and it takes us off this path of development or natural development as a society to, as self-determining people right and we imagine what if colonialism hadn't taken us off that path where would we be developed as people and I think indigenous people already are practicing those things right now. We have it built in within our societies. And so like at this moment in time, there's like just in the United States alone, there's 565 um, recognized, federally recognized indigenous nations, multiple more indigenous nations. Um, if we include ent the entire Turtle Island, one day, you know, all of those indigenous nations will rightfully take back their land and it'll be Washington, D.C. That'll be the fortified fortress uh, remaining it. And then we'll, of course, we'll get it back for our Piscataway relatives after that. So, <laughs> yeah. DC is chocolate city. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, I need more. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say that about Oakland, too. But yeah, also, like, I, I want to emphasize, like, for as the Red Nation, the process of decolonization is not just, it, there's a process of indigenization, re indigenizing. Uh, our political traditions, re-indigenizing, you know, our, our own revolutionary struggle, but at the same time, decolonization includes other colonized peoples. And so we must extend that kind of broader based um, uh, revolutionary project. Because we're not going to do to colonizers what they did to them. So. Even though they always say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Any other thoughts on that question? <laughs> never trust um, so if there are no more thoughts on that question, we have another question. Uh, if racism is a tactic of colonialism, and the African liberation struggle must be anti-colonial struggle, what does that mean for how we fight? So given the overall topic of the presentation, and what we talked about today, like how does that change how we struggle? Can you repeat that question, please? Sure. If racism is a tactic of colonialism and the African liberation struggle must be an anti-colonial struggle, what does that mean for how we fight? So what is the difference in how we struggle between an anti-racist struggle and an anti-colonial struggle? Yeah. I just hit me that the anti... <clears throat> the anti-colonialist struggle should be an anti-capitalist struggle. But... Uh, but uh, the racism part, uh, has to do with democracy, so uh, fighting corporations and getting back <coughs> individual democratic uh, agency, I think, is what the uh, larger revolution that includes more people from, you know, from the, uh, for, the, for the struggle, <coughs> for the struggle against fascism. That uh, so I do, linking linking a democracy to the uh, abolition of corporations mm -hmm. would be one way to uh, deal with racism and uh, capitalist exploitation. I would think. Any other thoughts? I see two hands. I'll get Monica and then the next person behind me. For me, I think that a lot of our work, our I feel like my work, has been on anti-racism lens and ways to get paradigm shift. Focus on anti colonialism because that's the only way we're going to address the big landscape. Mm -hmm. So that was really like, um, like a pill 
always do. Like you got to do this prayer and show that you don't want when people are going to continue to struggle because they're going to continue to struggle. You're never going to be able to be unified. So having that shift. Yeah. And the one thing that like is really important. When we think about anti-racism, when I talk to like African people anywhere in the course of organizing, if I ask them, do you think racism will ever end? The answer is always no. Like thinking about racism as like a structure that is infinite, that is always existed and will always exist, like takes away people's hope. But if you think about it as something that was created for a specific purpose at a specific period in time, then you think, can think about it as something that can end, something that can stop. And the other thing, the other difference is that anti-racist struggle depends on the existing colonial capitalist power structure, anti-colonial struggle depends on building power for ourselves, for colonized people. Hi, person. Hello. <laughs> uh, thank you for coming here. This is really lovely. And I think for me, being a new African, a lot of it breaks down to like, what does it mean to be the descendant of stolen bodies on a stolen land? And understanding that like the process of decolonization in Africa we united the African peoples. We also need to be focusing on the struggle on Turtle Island and what our role is as a ride on it. Because like, we didn't come here on a cruise, like we didn't want to come here to so, settle, you know, it wasn't even three months in the belly of those ships. So just kind of understanding like that our liberation is tied into native liberation here and Africa's liberation. So just following especially like indigenous family leadership, indigenous queer leadership, and understanding that like misogyny, transphobia, homophobia are all rooted in colonialism too. And when we combat colonialism, we can fight the And if it's anti-colonial, it has to be internationalized because you can't defeat colonialism in one place. And that means we have to move past the paradigm of the nation state, too, because I think nation states have served their historical purpose and they need to go away now. Okay, so we're going to push back a little bit on that. <laughs> uh, so the history of Europe is not the history of the world. And so for Europe, without question, your comment is correct. For Africa, we still are in the place where we need national liberation. And that's what we're talking about. So we can't just think because something hasn't worked for Europe that that's the analysis that works for the entire planet. Amanda, thoughts on this question? It's a really good discussion. Hi. And you also, you all already kind of said this, but um, the way that I kind of like the last two, three years learned uh, is that anti racism is based on like inclusion within the settler state, anti colonialism, like you said earlier, is like you know, dismantling that settler state. I think a lot of us have taught to seek inclusion within the system that exists and always try to be accepted and you know, get rid of the racism that prevents us from doing that. But in reality, it's, it will always be there. So. Yeah, and there's no, it's not an option for us to assimilate. Like, I figured it out at like 11. But it was yeah. not <laughs> so like, if you are stuck in this, like, oh, I have to like fit in, I gotta get a nine to five, I have to be accepted within like settler society, and you like look like us, or you're indigenous, and you realize it's not gonna happen, you're just like butting against, head against the wall, like for eternity. But if you recognize that this was never created for us, that this was is is openly antagonistic to us, and that our destiny depends on destroying it and making something better, then it's much more, it's easy to be more optimistic. So I have one last question. I think a drama should have. Just the one by after these. Okay, so here it is. What is your understanding of the relationship between Africa and your everyday lives here in the US? Do you think there's a relationship? Yeah, is there a relationship? <laughs> what is it? I would say that in part that that depends on who you are. Okay? Um, you know, if you are somebody who identifies as, as African, then your, your experience is going to be directly related to um, the Africans that, that um, are still oppressed to this day in the world, right? If you're somebody who identifies as an oppressed person, then you're going to experience some of that oppression as well. Your identity is somebody who is, um, say, for instance, you know, um, white or class, right? Uh, you know, wealthy, then you're going to um, have the experience of the oppressor in both places. Um, if your experience is is somebody who, you know, walks blindly through life as a member of this society, then your experience is that of somebody who, uh, knowingly or unknowingly. Um, take, takes advantage and gives it the advantage of the oppression of people all over Africa. Um, so I think it depends, I, it, it, it in part depends on who you are. 
can ask a follow up because that was a really good point, especially about walking blindly through this colonial society um, and unwillingly benefiting. What does anybody have examples of specific benefits that you might have, even if you're not aware of any of this, what we just talked about today, or anything like it? I'm just looking for a visual oh, aid. That's what I'm looking for. Palestinian who was born on Turtle Island, um, whose you know, family immigrated here because of colonization of Palestine. Um, I think a lot about what it took to become you know, American. Right? Um, and so what it meant for um, my ancestors and for the community of Arabs that came to this country meant um, adopting white supremacy. Right? And, and ignoring indigenous struggles and saying, you know, this land is, you know, a land of immigrants and um, Arabs, you know, you know, asserted that they were white because there was no other way to become a citizen. Um, so we, you know, we have become, you know, part of this system because that's what it means to become part of American society. So I, you know, obviously, you know, the wealth that is that surrounds us, the way that we were able to build you know, build our community in this country is based on um, anti-black racism, on an acceptance of what um, slavery you know, built in this country without acknowledging it, um, an acceptance of um, you know, an erasure of indigenous culture. So all of that is very much part of the immigrant experience. So that's just something that comes to my mind, how Africa is part of my life. I think specifically had our ethnic and tribal identities forcibly erased from us, um, separated on the ships, not able to speak our languages, segregated on plantations, so um, so having Africa is the only thing we can look to as like, I know I'm from there, but not exactly there. And you've been able to hold on to that a long time. Yeah. So just to add really quick to that, to building on that, I, I like, love everything everyone's saying. But just a reminder, like if you got rubber in your clothes right now, that's your connection to Africa. 60% of the rubber used in this country comes from Liberia. So that's your connection. If you drove here in a car or came here in a gas powered vehicle, then during the summer months in this country, 60% of the oil in this country comes from Nigeria. And these are all systems of colonialism, right, that are set up. If you have, if you got a car or, or if you, you uh, if you got a, uh, if you're drinking water out of aluminum, Thing, that bauxite that produced that is is from Guinea. So you know these are like concrete, y'all, manifestations of the colonial system that was set up. That are still somebody is dying right now because they're mining that stuff. Somebody right now is dying because of that stuff. And so that's why for us, like we don't even understand the term African American. Like that's like that, that's like someone saying that, that that's like a a Jewish survivor of the Holocaust saying I'm a I'm a Jewish Hitler. Yeah. You know, how could you how could you say that? Like I don't even understand that. So we just want to say that. And then even like the question of occupied Palestine, 30% of Israel's economy is polished diamonds. There ain't no diamond mines in occupied Palestine. Those diamonds come from Zimbabwe and the Congo and Azania, South Africa. So that again, just to make that point, this entire capitalist economy is based on exploiting Africa. That's why, y'all, we burn this country down from plantations to cities, because we are never meant to fit in this country, and we never will. And y'all that still think that we can, hey, I want to see, uh, let's have a conversation in 100 years, because it's, 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 it was never designed to do that. So that was all the questions we had from y'all. Do you have questions for us? Oh, also sugar and coffee. Oh, yeah. It's coming entirely from Africa. So, if you've had any of those in the last week, Coca. Mm -hmm. Coca. Well, where do you get your strength from? Um, I have centuries, like hundreds of years of resistance in my blood, in my ancestry, in my culture. I have the product of centuries of struggle and brilliance and resistance on the part of African people. I believe that African people have everything we need within us to save ourselves. And so, I feel like a deep commitment to carry forward that struggle. 
Because we can liberate ourselves. We have everything we need. We just need to be organized. So yeah, it's extremely motivating. How about you? Dope. Okay. Um, yeah, definitely the strength of my ancestors. Um, my mother uh, was born in Montego Bay, St. James Parish, Jamaica. Uh, my father was born in Oakland, California. So, like, my personal history is just all over the colonized uh, Western Hemisphere. Um, and just learning about those struggles, people who may or may not be directly related to me, still my ancestors, and still have that cultural connection. Um, just the, you know, in, in like black American culture, they say do it for the culture. That's not an accident. That did not come from nowhere. Um, you can think about things that others have produced for your benefit at the very least, not the least of which is you yourself. Um, and I also actually get direct visions from my ancestors sometimes. They never like tell me what to do, but they will come to me with dreams and visions of what their lives were like. Um, just little snippets and pieces that keep me motivated and keep me going when I get really depressed and despondent. Because I mean like, you know, David wasn't like all goofy and smiling when he faced down Goliath. He was anxious and nervous. Um, but he had to get that strength from somewhere, so I get it from my ancestors. So for me, it happened when I was 11, I was on a city bus and the Singletary brothers, there were four of them, and they used to terrorize the neighborhood. And they got on the bus and they robbed everybody on the bus. And they, they you know, they, they grew like pistol whip people, just terrible. I was, I was terrified because I knew they would kill you and eat fools in your refrigerator. So I was probably the most scared person on the bus. And so when they got off the bus, one of them looked at me because they knew me from the neighborhood and said, excuse my language, don't say shit, and then got off the bus. So I sat there, I'm immobilized, I'm, I'm 11 years old. And when the police came, all the white people on the bus said he was with them, talking about me. And they threw me down. So from that point on, I knew I wasn't an American. I understood that clearly. I didn't know what I was. And I went through several years of mass confusion. But because of this struggle, being able to understand kind of what both of my family here said, like who we actually are. And like there's nothing wrong with us. There's nothing wrong with anybody in this room. There's nothing wrong with you. The problem is the system. And understanding all the things that I learned that were wrong, like patriarchy like homophobia, all that stuff is, is, is imposed upon us to keep us separate and to keep us from supporting each other as family. And understanding that in the Pan-African movement is what helped me come to that place. So yeah, I mean, the ancestors are crucial in that in terms of understanding like, you know, I'm not here to be what this system wants me to be, you know, and understanding like I'm here to be, to try to do the best I can to exhibit what a human being is supposed to be. And it's this movement I, I would be dead without this movie. Hi, Monica. How do you organize our people? When we look at that, we are just complacent with what happens. And I think about New Mexico, we're not a huge population here, we're scattered. Mm -hmm. So we don't have like that sense of community. Um, I feel like as we did when I was growing up, because we're scattered. And that was gentrification and strategic. And so how do we, um, it's like even in bigger cities, right, we're still divided. So, <clears throat> What are some strategies that you all are seeing that are successful in organizing our people to move toward like uh, anti-colonial organization? Yeah, sure. So I, I don't know if you know, you, you, you all probably don't know this, but um, so Adrian and I lived together in Portland for a number of years and organized in the party there. And Portland is the same as here. There's not a lot of Africans there. and. Um, but there's a lot of issues <laughs> important. So, you know, we took the position that um, because of the alienation, we would use that to our advantage. Um, because what I found, as opposed to California, is that in Portland, when you went to talk to people, because they were so alienated, there weren't so many distractions. In a lot of ways, it was easier to talk to people if you had a focused message. So we took the position that that's what we would do, and we went after people aggressively. After we went into communities, we went wherever we could, and we talked to people, and we got people. We got people to, you know, I mean, we got people to come. One person here, two there, three there, and we just organized them around a vision. You know, we, we one of the things we do have in our organization is a vision and a plan and a strategy. So we were able to communicate that to people, and people wanted that because a lot of times that's lacking. And so we, we just, we saw the alienation as something we could utilize in terms of our organization, instead of seeing it as a, as a adverse thing. And I think you could do the same, I mean, I've only been here a few times, but I see a lot of the same kind of things that you could, 
utilize here and get people involved. And then once you start to build capacity, people just start coming. And the other thing I would add to that is that Malcolm X quote, you can't organize a sleeping people around a strategy. You have to wake them up first. So that is like the first step. Like the primary problem that African people are facing now is ideological. We've been indoctrinated into a lot of the values and a lot of like the contradictions of the system and we're like acting out upon each other. And so like putting out like an alternate um, analysis of what's happening to us and where it came from is like really, really important, which is why we do events like this, and which is why we do a lot of our, our organizing work focuses on like mass political education. Because we have to un ha like have our people understand um, that this was done to us, that there's nothing wrong with us, that we can end this, that we have the power to do so. So that's an ideological problem. Well, I'd like to also add to that, um, that if you have ever felt alone as an African person in this country and in this world, um, we all have, and that fact is the connector right there. Um, let me have that. Another question over here. It's not open up, especially yeah. in It was in the 80s, like shortly after Tony and Naya were governor, that state form for employment only had two dollars. And if you look like me, it was not suggested. You were told you're supposed to mark annual. Mm -hmm. There were black people walking around, their little badges and shit. <laughs> that meant that they bought into that stuff. Mm -hmm. Understand that. So in order to wake them up, we got to jump deep into their internal life. First thing we got to do in terms of organizing that is organize our own brain and understand you can't bring everybody. I think that everybody we should exclude is the African bourgeois, though. <laughs> like, sorry, Beyonce. Any other questions? <laughs> I have a question just about. Um, your socialist program, um, often, I mean, there's rampant anti-communism around the world, especially in the first world, the colonized world. Um, and I was just wondering how you deal with that because it can't, it, there's, but then there's also um, racism and chauvinism and colonialism within the socialist movement itself. And one thing that always um, amazes me is that people think that socialism began with Marx and Engels. Right. Yeah. And so I wonder, um, can you just talk a little bit how you guys, um, I'm not you guys, but how you all yeah. um, confront that, but also how you theorize socialism. Something that, I mean, because when I say, when you say social, social means like relations between people, right? right? And so I just want to hear a little bit more about that program. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. And that actually, the last uh, discussion, thank you for that as well. Because I think one of the strategies in terms of reaching people is that we take the position that we are going to hit you in the mouth with the truth. <laughs> we're going to knock you on your rear end with the truth. And people want that because this society, everything about this society is based on lies. So when you come with the truth, people people want that. They respond to that. So that gets to the question about socialism. And again, you know, the history of Europe is not the history where you're absolutely correct. You know, people talked about socialism long before Karl Marx. We had Africans in Africa in the 12th century, even Khaldun, if you want to look, look, look him up who was talking about surplus labor in the 12th century. So the mistake that's made, and it's a part of colonialism, is that, well, Beethoven invented music. We were drunk before Beethoven could spell music. You know? So, or Newton, you know, if you drop, the body's still going to fall at the same rate. Because, you know, he didn't invent, like, he might have, these people might have been the first people to write it down and give them credit for that. But we take, we have our own ideology. We call it incrumism Therese. We take it from... Kwame Nkrumah, who we talked about a little bit, Sekou Ture, Amilcar Cabral, Carmen Piala, all of these Africans who fought for African unity. And, you know, there are some things that Marx, Lenin, Engels, Kosky, uh, all of them said, Trotsky, all of them, 
that were good, Mao, they were good, but we take our prison, like Cabral said, you can't import ideology. So we take it from our culture and our experience. And that's why like our party, just one quick example, two quick examples, is a mass party. We're not, we're not a vanguard, we don't believe in vanguard parties. We believe in collectivism. So any, any African can join our political party. Another thing is that we're not atheists. We don't believe religion is the opium of the people. African people are spiritual people. You can't go to an African community and somebody you don't believe in God and nobody gonna listen to you. <laughs> so, you know, we take and we don't even believe that. We believe we believe in the spirituality of Miss Fanny Lou Hamer when she said, When them crackers come to my house, I got a shotgun that Lord give me power to aim straight. That's the <laughs> spirituality we believe in. We believe in that. So we don't have any, you know, we we we're pretty clear about how we approach the question of socialism and whatever you know European socialists can, we can get from that we take it but that's not our foundation. I think we have time for like one more question if anyone else has one. Jerome. Um yeah um maybe how would you distinguish yourself from other uh you know African revolutionary groups that uh, that are active? I mean we maintain relationships with African revolutionary organizations like throughout the United States throughout the throughout the continent like our strategy is one of like unifying all of these national liberation organizations around the goal of a unified socialist Africa. So we don't like, sectarianism is like not a thing that we pursue. Like if they have a different line or a different um, approach to what we're trying to accomplish, if we have the same goal, then we, there's a basis of unity. Like that's the approach we take. Um, oh, and one last thing. Somebody, some uh, one question it was mentioned, um, what kind of ideas do you not take? And specifically about patriarchy, there's a question about that. And that we do have, we actually are all on the anti-patriarchy um, group. Working group, yeah. Working group. Yeah, so that that and is a constant struggle that you have to do everywhere. I think a lot of people have mentioned that. I think it was like Lazarus that said that like um, destroying genders and then criminalizing queer identity was like part of the process of colonialism, part of like dividing and subjugating and colonized people. And so we recognize that and that we have to destroy those contradictions within our struggle to advance them. So like the gender contradictions are part, and the struggle against patriarchy are part of the struggle for, for pan-Africanism. And you know, often like the perception is that, well, Africa is backward on these questions. But you know, we have, we have international calls because we have chapters all over the world. So we had one recently that we were on, and we were, we were arguing about how, as a part of this, how this, this group came about, that we needed to wage more struggle around these questions of, of gender, of patriarchy and all of these questions that we need to do that party wide, and it was some of the comrades from Africa, from Kenya, that were like, "Yeah, we definitely need to do that. You know, let's make that happen now." So, you know, this is a part of our work, like that we want to see happen. We want to. And Kruma talks about a new African. That's what we want, not like separating us from other Africans, but a new thinking person with new values. That's that's what we're trying to do. Um, so once again, I want to thank you very much for coming to our workshop. We're really excited about this turnout. Um, if you are a person of African descent, please come talk to us. Um, we definitely want to talk to you about joining the AFIP. We need more people here to build up the chapter. If you're kind of shy, which is fine, because I am too, then you can email us at AFIPNewMexico at gmail.com, and we'll get back to you right away. And then if you're not of African descent, you're in luck, because Albuquerque has like a number of really strong left organizations that desperately need um, capacity to build their capacity so you can join those. Obviously the Red Nation is the organizer of this conference. Um, there's also Black Rose with the Negro Albuquerque, which is an anarchist organization that we work with and respect. Um, there's Millions for Prisoners New Mexico, which is an abolitionist organization working around prisoners' rights. The International Workers of the World, or the IWW, which is trying to build what like one big radical union, so there's like the corporate unions, <laughs> like the business unions, who are like racist. And then there's like the IWW that like, has a long history of anti-colonial and anti-imperial struggle. So definitely check them out. And then lastly, the Democratic Socialists of America Albuquerque is a good um, or for folks who are like kind of leery about all this like revolution talk. And we're like, <laughs> 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 like a little bit more mellow. mellow. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you. <laughs> um, who's up next? Did y'all need this? Would yeah. you have to know who is up next? I want to see if they need the projector. No? I'm going to turn it off then. Can you hold it?